Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello. Well, as Egyptian voters go to the polls in an atmosphere of anger and some fear, we're going to be talking about democracy, dictators and realpolitik, not just whether the Arab Spring is bringing in Islamist winter, but we'll be talking about Europe as well, where tough economic measures are being imposed from above. Simon Heffer of the Daily Mail, author of A Short History of Power, argues that history repeats itself, things don't have to get better. Martin Wolf, chief economics writer at the Financial Times, discusses the rise of the technocrat in politics, but we're going to start with the Arab world. Maha Azam, an expert in political Islam based in London, has been back in her birthplace, Cairo, observing events in Tahrir Square, while Ghana's George Ayatea, author of Defeating Dictators, Fighting Tyranny in Africa and Around the World, has some warnings for the Arab Spring. George, let's start with you. You have a phrase that you use in relation to other parts of Africa, uh, crocodile liberators. Let's start with that. Who are they? Well, um, okay. first of all, thank you for having me. And um, um, I'd like to start by saying that, you know, we've gone through these revolutions before in sub-Saharan Africa. In the early 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, where Africa had its village revolutions beginning in Benin. In 1991, and then it went to Sao Tome, and then it went to uh, uh, Mali, and then uh, Zambia, eventually to South Africa in 1994. Now, w- w- there were some painful lessons for us, mm. and the lessons were that you know what we we managed to get rid of long-standing autocrats and dictators, but in many many countries, okay, the replacements were worse. And in other words, you know, Africans have this, you know, saying, we struggle very hard to remove one cockroach from power, and then the next rat comes to do the same thing. Mm. Now, those replacements are those that I call the crocodile liberators. Look at Ethiopia, for example. We got rid of Mengistu, uh, Hail Mariam in 1991. We now have Zinawi, and it wasn't, you know, uh, Mengistu. So the thing is, you know, what, you know, I think uh, the lesson, there are some lessons which the Arab Spring can learn from us. And do you fear that that same kind of replacement of one bad regime by a, 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 one as bad or a worse could happen, despite all this great optimism about Yeah, you life? know, this is where, you know, my fear lies. And, you know, and it's not just in, you know, we, we've seen this happen in Eastern Europe where you've had the reversals of the revolution. I mean, right now, you know, take a look at Georgia, for example, or even Ukraine, for example, where you have a, a reversal of the revolution. Now, I think a lot of people... Uh, you know, moving from a dictatorship to a free society involves two basic steps. First, you get rid of the dictator. Now, having gotten rid of the dictator, you have to dissemble the dictatorship itself. In far too many cases, we neglect to deform or to dissemble the dictatorship. I mean, if you look at Africa's post-colonial experience, we got rid of the white dictators, but we did not dismantle the authoritarian colonial state. So those who took over acted exactly like the same, like the colonialists. I want to come back to that because it's a very difficult business to disassemble one state and produce another without chaos in between. But before we return to that, I just want to ask Maha about wh- wh- whether you think that there is a danger um, after the Arab Spring that we are going to see a series of repressive regimes returning to the region of a different nature. I think the main danger is that we won't have complete revolutions. We won't have real change. I think what we may have is an electoral process that brings about uh, a, 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 a government that's accountable and greater participation, which is a huge step compared to where much of the Arab world has been for decades. Mm. Whether that then means social justice, which is one of the demands of the protesters, whether it means redistribution of wealth, whether it means you won't see some of the old faces and some of the corruption that's existed for decades, that is still a very serious challenge in these countries. And it's not going to happen overnight. You've got security services to deal with that are still intact. You've got a brutal police force that still kills protesters. So, in a sense, you have the beginnings of change, some serious moves towards democratisation, but a long way to go. So, picking up on on what George was saying there, um, in Egypt in particular... We saw the end of Mubarak, but not the end of Mubarakism. We didn't. We haven't seen the end of a regime that has supported Mubarak through the military, and not only Mubarak supported Sadat and Nasser. So for 60 years, since 1952, 
Egypt's back, the backbone to its dictatorial regime has been the military, and the military is still at the forefront of politics today. Um, we're going to talk about power more generally, but Simon uh, Heffer, would you say that there is a kind of lesson already in what we've seen, this notion that um, there are revolutions, um, dictators are removed from power, history moves steadily forward for ever-increasing liberal um, freedoms, that this is, that this is a folly? Well, I, I've never swallowed what you've just described as the Whig interpretation of history, and I've never really swallowed that. And, indeed, something that George said resonated very strongly with me. I remember going to Kenya in 1988, my first visit to Africa, and the thug, and he was a white man, the thug who ran the police service in Kenya was, in, was still there in post from colonial days, which had finished 25 years earlier. And, of course, he was immensely useful to Arap Moy because he knew all the, all the armoury of repression. He knew how to do it both physically and, and, and mentally. And one thing I've always thought was very wrong with Africa was that the boundaries that had been largely drawn up by the white man in the 19th century uh, were left in place when empire, whether it was our empire or the Belgians or the, or, or the French or the Germans, when empire went away. And clearly there was a time, um, and it's past now, maybe it was 50 or 60 years ago, for those boundaries to be redrawn. And you say this in your book, George, that um, federation is the natural... Uh, way for these countries to run themselves, and I'm sure that's right because the the if you like the the European imposed boundaries simply don't function properly, and they allow this concentration of authority and power, which is so incredibly unhelpful to democracy, but very very helpful to a dictator. Especially the unitary state system. Mm. Yes. Mm. And that's th that would also be the case across much of the Arab world as well, wouldn't mm -hmm. it, Maya? Because, I mean, th thinking o only of Libya, which is a line in the sand and two very, very different uh, societies and cultures. And very much so, and the problem is that these are artificial boundaries and the old argument is that they were drawn by colonialism and what you have also are ethnic and religious groups in these countries that are clamouring for their rights and you have a very centralised state that uh, in its essence was, is authoritarian till this day and you've got to find some mechanism by which you have these people represented either through democracy or greater federation. Martin Wolf. Well, first of all, I, I must say that I'm rather more optimistic than Simon, probably a little Whiggish. Uh, it seems to me in the large things go up and down, but it's absolutely clear if you look at the, the longer history over a century or more, um, and even over the last 30 years, the, 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 the proportion of the world which has been ruled by democracies has clearly increased. The fall of the Soviet Union was a significant event. And second, there have been some very successful transitions, Central and Eastern Europe, not the former Soviet Union itself, but if you think the countries that have joined the European Union. To me, because I used to work on these countries, the transformation of South Korea, when I worked on it, really was a military dictatorship. It's completely different now. Taiwan is another mm -hmm. example. Even Indonesia is clearly better than it was under Suharto. Uh, things are usually not perfect, but I would suggest there are conditions in which democracy evolves, and I also happen to think it is the natural way for, for sophisticated economies to be run. Well, let's, in, in that case, turn to the conditions um, that are required, because in your book, George, you can lay out more or less a sort of programme of what has to happen, in your view, in what order to move uh, from a, a dictatorship <coughs> to a democracy. So let's talk. It, and it doesn't start, in your view, with economic liberalisation. Well, no, it, it's... Um, and I think this is where... I have a little bit of uh, disagreement with uh, Martin on this. Uh, and in fact, he says that, uh, you know, if you look at Britain, Britain didn't start with democracy. Britain started with the Industrial Revolution. And also, if you look at, you know, the Asian Tigers, for instance, they had authoritarian regimes, and they were able to, uh, you know, the Asian, you know, they were able to have successful economic development and later on democracies. That's fine. <clears throat> but the circumstances today are totally different. I mean, today we have the internet, we have radio, we have television, and we have free flow of information. Britain didn't have the internet back in the 19th century. Okay? And today we should also remember that, you know, you look at, you know, Terrier Square, okay? The West doesn't get it, okay? The West for far too long has invested a lot of capital on the rhetoric and the charisma of scrofulous dictators. Now, look at Terrier Square. It was the people who were speaking, not the dictators. Now, as, as a matter of fact, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the Arab Spring caught the West completely by surprise. Now, the point that, you know, we have to move from is we have to move from this leader-centered, okay, development model to one which is people-centered. 
what the people are saying. But coming back to what you were saying earlier on about the difficulties, the dangers of moving yes. from one bad regime to the next, to avoid that, once you've got your people, Pearl, once you've got um, people camping out in your main square and the, the regime beginning to totter, how do, what is the way that you move from that through to start to, to create a more democratic You have state? to have a credible body, OK, to make the transition. Egypt doesn't have the credible body. It has the military. The military is the wrong body to be shepherding in... Uh, so political parties? No. You, I mean, look at Afghanistan, OK? In 2003, uh, when Afghanistan was going to make a peaceful transition to democratic rule, it convened what is called a lawyer jigger, mm -hmm. OK? In Bonn, OK? A grand council, OK? The Arabs have a grand council called Majli, mm -hmm. OK? That is where, you know, you have representatives of various people. So you have to go South back to Africa, traditional, traditional precisely, structures. South Africa also had the same thing. South Africa made a transition by convening a CODESA, Convention for a Democratic South Africa. Okay? Benin made a successful transition by convening a sovereign national conference. Okay? It is important that the body which makes the transition must have credibility. That's number one, key. Once you do that, the second step is to have constitutional reform as well as institutional reform. Institutional reform is very key. If you don't have institutional reform and you try to advance economic liberalization, this is what Eastern Europe did with the shock therapy, okay, uh, in Poland and also Czechoslovakia and Russia. What happened there? When do you introduce economic liberalization without institutional well, reform? The answer is in some cases it works, as Martin Wolf was saying, and in some cases it didn't. Well, and it, the question is, why did it work in some places and not in others? Well, because the institutions haven't been reformed. The nomenclatura was still in power. The communists were still in power. Those who had inside information, okay, benefited. So, That's why in Russia you have eight oligarchs, okay, become instant billionaires. Yeah. Because they had inside information, the political playing field was not level. So, taking that notion of what we might call civil society and the institutions required to make the transition, let's return to North Africa and um, Egypt in particular. Um, because, as you said, uh, we, we, we've got the army there, um, Maya, and they've been there for a very long time. They've been there certainly since NASA, as you mentioned. Um, there is a lively press, but the other huge institution or huge organization there, of course, is the Muslim Brotherhood, um, which goes way back into Egyptian history, is well dug in, particularly to the poorer areas of Cairo and other parts of Egypt, um, has its own agenda and is expected to do extremely well in today's parliamentary elections. Now, the question is, is there a version of political Islam which is going to be open and liberal enough in Egypt and in other countries to allow real democratization, or is this what we in the West would call an Islamist power grab? I think we're seeing uh, a more liberal and open minded Islamist political party in Tunisia under the Nahda. We can say that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is not as liberal and open minded and not as tolerant of secular and liberal ideas. But what we can say clearly is that they are engaged in the political process, that all their statements and their activities are uh, clearly going down the line of pursuing the democratic path. They're the ones that have suffered most under military dictatorship and that ultimately that these main parties, like others, are committed to the democratic process. Now, it's up to the Egyptian electorate to choose whether mm. they want the Muslim Brotherhood or not, but we've got to be careful of scaremongering. Now, either we're talking about people choosing what they think is an authentic uh, representative, and if that authentic representative has something of an Islamic agenda for an Islamic friendly society, then we've got to accept that decision. I think what we're going to find is people are going to vote in Egypt for very many different groups. The Brotherhood are the most entrenched, the ones that have worked at a grassroots level, and they will probably uh, manage a very substantial block. They have to work in concert with others, and I think the, uh, the Brotherhood are a very astute uh, political player, and they know that. They don't want to take the burden of Egypt's economic problems. And that ties in, in some ways, with the importance of both going hand in hand, political liberalisation and economic mm. opening up. And Egypt can't survive without dealing with its economic problems. And how far is Turkey an important role model in terms of a democracy that has an 
uh, Islamist government um, and has managed uh, economic liberalisation and has managed to maintain an open society? Well, throughout the Arab world at the moment, Turkey is extremely uh, popular with its leader Erdogan because it's somehow ma uh, managed this marriage between an Islamic identity and economic development. So for many, particularly Islamists, that is uh, a model that they look up to. And of course, because they've also taken a nationalist stance, one that's very populist over Israel um, um, and in uh, over Syria. And these have made Turkey particularly popular. So it's not just Turkey as a model of economic development, it's what Turkey now stands for mm. in terms of the Arab street. And Maha, would you agree that the um, liberalisation of the media, free media, um, proper political openness has to come before economic liberalisation? If you push economic liberalisation first, you may simply entrench unfairnesses and uh, I, old elites. I think what happened in Egypt and the Arab world, as you opened up economically there were demands for a freer media and as the media opened up ever so slowly under Mubarak voices could be heard and slowly the barrier of fear broke. When you have a, a growing middle class that is doing well you have people who are demanding because, start to say we want to have a share in political power and that's what's happening throughout the region as well. Simon Heffer. When we think about um, regimes going into reverse there was this brief window in the 1990s albeit under um, the slightly idiotic Yeltsin, where Russia did appear to be moving towards something approaching democracy. And in the Putin years, we saw the media coming under attack, and it was a very important weapon in the decision of uh, <coughs> Putin, or the, the, the uh, scheme of Putin, to take control of his country and take control of opinion. He started having um, journalists thrown out of, of, of windows. He started taking over television stations. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's right. When you take control of the media, it means that the, the message of hope, that sense that a lot of people are in it together and have a common cause is completely suppressed. I mean, again, we think back to 1989, and we were told at the time, I'm sure it's true, that one of the things that drove East Germany to want to have the Berlin Wall torn down and to unite with the West was they'd been able to watch the television West German stations. television stations yeah. for years. Mm -hmm. So, of course, that's, that's absolutely right. Martin, do you want to come in on this? Or I've just had uh, one major point. <laughs> I don't see the... The necessary condition for democracy is economic liberalisation. I think of it somewhat more as economic development. At least one needs, and this has already been mentioned, one needs, I think, for a stable democracy. Uh, there are exceptions, but there are exceptions. India is perhaps the most remarkable exception, so it's very difficult to generalise. But having a sizable middle class, a reasonably literate population, people with uh, independent positions, independent of the state, in their jobs, their lives, uh, I think really does help sustain, a, sustain over time a stable democracy. Uh -huh. I think the thirst for freedom of speech for accountability and participation, for example, is seen throughout the Arab world, in the poorer countries of Egypt and Tunisia, but there's a growing demand even in the Gulf states. So this tells us that even in countries that have oil wealth, that you have a, a, a vibrant, educated class, and even a, a growing youth that are open to the world, a globalised world, that are demanding a greater say in the running of their lives. Well, part of this story is demography, isn't it? I mean, you look at the demography around the Arab world, absolutely astonishing the number of people under the age of 22 or something. And this is very much part of the revolution, so to speak, that it is a revolution of the young, if nothing else, and their demand for participation, to have their say. And this is what they don't like also about the presence of the old mm. oligarchies in the military. They're saying these men are very old and uh, we need a new and vibrant government to lead us. George Ayate. Yeah, um, I think, you know, one of the things that we have to be extremely careful about economic liberalisation is that, um, you know, when you have a dictator in power, a dictator never, never, never levels the political playing field nor the economic playing field. If you ask a dictator to implement economic liberalization, he will implement only those types of economic liberalization that benefits him, his family, his cronies, and his tribe. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is what happened in Egypt in, in the sense that, you know, the economic liberalization benefited Mubarak's family. In fact, his family was alleged to have amassed a family fortune of $40 billion dollars. As, as a matter of fact, one of the demands of the uh, protesters at Sahari Square was to roll back 
the economic liberalization of um, under, that occurred under uh, Mubarak, and also to hold well, its it wasn't really a, In a sense, it wasn't really economic liberalization. It, it, it was it was the the taking over of large sections of the economy by the you army know, you, and by you, the, the you, dictator's you've family. Seen ex- you saw exactly the same thing in Tunisia. You saw exactly yeah. the same sure. thing, um, you know, in. Um, Many, many countries where, you know, dictators, when they are in charge, you know, also make sure that same thing happened in Indo- Indonesia. Mm. I'd like to, to, to turn to the other great question which has been hanging around, around this conversation, the other great uh, force in the world, which is China, because there we have a country which is in many, certainly economically developed, whether it's completely liberal is, is another question, and has so far achieved that without political liberalisation of any kind uh, or any real kind, and is a huge player, of course, in, in both in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and indeed in, in, in North Africa as well. So the question is, um, with so much of the world, China, Russia, neither classical dictatorships nor liberal democracies, liberal societies, I come back to this question, as it were, the Fukuyama question, uh, and Simon Heffer can maybe address this because it's important in your short history of power, Simon, uh, whether or not... Um, it is inevitable that we move towards um, liberal democracies or whether the realities of power, the realities of conflict between um, religious and economic forces just, just turn us back, back to the past again and again. Well, I suspect at some stage the Chinese are going to realise they could be even more successful if they were a democracy than they are as a dictatorship. And as they become more and more interested in wealth and prosperity... I hope, for their sake, that that democratic urge takes over. But what I've argued in my book is that history changes course and has changed course really since Thucydides, who is uh, our first Western historian, um, for, for four basic reasons. They're about territorial security, about ideology, about religion, and about wealth. And it's now up to China whether it's takes the course that so many other successful nations have taken and at most stages in history there are that there is a dominant nation it was spain in the 16th century it was us in the late 18th 19th century it was germany before the first world war it's america in the 20th century those uh, powers have always gone their, their economic prosperity has always eventually gone hand in hand with some sense of, of liberalisation. If they failed to liberalise, as the Spanish did famously, you don't get, um, you don't stay in charge for, for very long. And I would expect that there will at some stage be a tussle in China between a younger generation, maybe that's looking more to the West, who thinks that, for example, liberalising an internal market in China would make them ever so much more prosperous than they are at the moment. Just a faint whiff of Whiggism in, in, in that a analysis. Faint whiff. A faint whiff. Uh, Martin. Yeah, more than faint, I think. Uh, the... <laughs> Quite disappointed in Simon. The uh, I think the I've, I've I don't consider myself expert, but I've been visiting China very very regularly and followed it very closely. Um, first, obviously, there has been an enormous amount of economic development. It's not a rich country. It's very very important to stress this. It's a very big economy, uh, but still a pretty poor country. I think it's ranked about a hundredth uh, in GDP per head. And the the reason for this, is, of course, is the population. So it's important to stress how far its economic development has to go. So I think because of this, as it gets richer, the pressure from within for democratisation, for listening to the people become greater. They're already very frightened about the internet. And it is important to stress that China is clearly not a democracy. It's very different from Maoist China. It has been really transformed in very profound ways. I guess there will be the transition. It'll probably be very messy. I don't think it will reverse the economic development of China, which is, seems to be deeply rooted in the desires of the Chinese people. And it will probably emerge as a huge power rather more democratic than now perhaps very much more democratic than now and and, uh, and probably the world's biggest power the other oh. question is, is that of Chinese imperialism and we know that China has become a very big and I use the term euphemistically investor in Africa and mm. I, I think George and I would agree on this that this is not necessarily a good thing for Africa um, because this it stops short of being what we might call fair trade between um, Africa and China, and it, it is about the sort of colonisation I think that we saw when Cecil Rhodes was in Africa in the late 19th century. Now that can't be healthy. Would you agree with that, George? Oh yeah, I mean uh, the type of you know Chinese forays into Africa can be characterised as chopsticks mercantilism. I mean, I mean Africa needs investment, but you know the investment is coming in 
you know, and a very dubious and unwholesome, you know, circumstances. China has, you know, signed a blizzard of deals with dictators in Africa. Uh, and these, uh, they are not transparent, you know, they are opaque, and the deals are secured through uh, uh, bribery and also through kickbacks, for example. Tabo Mbeck is warned about a new type of Chinese neocolonialism in Africa. But I want to come back to Africa, uh, to a certain model uh, that Simon mentioned, and that is, um, look, economic liberalization, okay, capitalism, is productive. It generates, it engenders prosperity. But eventually, that prosperity hits a political ceiling. And we've seen this so many times. When it hits that political ceiling and the leadership opens up, the prosperity can continue. If the leadership adamantly refuses to open up the political space... So this space, would apply to China, what you're saying? Yes. Instance, uh, yeah. If the leadership refuses to open up, the country would implode. Tibet will break away. The north, east, western part of China will break away. We've seen this happen. Remember, Ivory Coast used to be called an economic success story. A miracle. What happened? It refused to open up the political space. It blew up. Like Madagascar used to be called an economic success story. What happened? It refused to open up the political space. Indonesia, so hard to refuse to open up the political space. Chile, Pinochet was able to open up the political I, space and save the country. I can feel the shade of Francis Fukuyama, who famously talked about the end of history, beginning to nod in the corner of this room, um, <laughs> which is very interesting. Can we turn, Ma, to, to the influence of China? Because it's not simply sub-Saharan Africa, of course. Um, huge Chinese investment in Gaddafi's uh, Libya held things back for a long time. Huge Chinese engagement and Russian engagement in Syria is what is stopping international condemnation there. So what happens in China, the nature of Chinese society, political society, affects what's happening in Tahir Square, what's happening across the Arab world too? I think the problem is that because the United States has had such a big and negative role in the eyes of many in the region, they think by turning to China somehow this is an alternative. And this exists even among the young today. They'll say, we won't accept the IMF loan, we can do business with others. They don't realise to what extent China actually represents everything that they're fighting against. I was in Beijing recently. My enemy's enemy is my enemy too. Exactly. And, well, in, uh, mm. and, and in Beijing, they're very interested in the Arab string at the level of policy, at the level of government and so on. Really, how to stop it? What are the mistakes they shouldn't make? And this is, <laughs> this is, this is a a very, very worrying concern. But I think on the issue of liberal democracy, I think it's important that we make a distinction. Whether in China or across the Arab world, what you have is a call for greater respect for the rule of law and greater respect for human rights, accountability and participation. These are components of democracy, liberal democracy, but it doesn't mean that the end model is going to be a replica of Western democracy. I now want, on that note to turn a little bit nearer to home here to look what's happening inside the European Union at the moment because this does relate um, to, the, to the whole question of how much genuine power to change things people have. We have in Greece, we have in Italy, we have in, not in Spain but certainly in Greece and Italy technocratic governments imposed effectively um, economists and bankers being parachuted in to impose austerity measures um, required to save the euro. Martin Wolf, this is a is is this as as dangerous a development as it sounds in the way I've just put it? I sometimes joke, I admit a little facetiously, that the purpose of the European Union was to save uh, Europe from democracy. Uh, and I'm not being entirely facetious because, of course, the people who founded it were very, very concerned for good historical reasons about what could happen if democracy went crazy. They thought back to the 30s. So the, the whole structure involves a... A deep, technocratic, a deep a of technocratic, quasi, uh, quasi bureaucratic, and quasi democratic superstructure, a bit of a parliament, and so forth, on top of the genuinely democratic nation states. Now, what you're seeing in the eurozone now is a head-on clash between the two, because the the uh, states aren't behaving the way that the structure that is being created requires them to behave. And uh, in this clash, the states are in a very weak position because they can't raise money, therefore they're bankrupt. So the, the centre, as it were, is in a very good position to exert 
influence, not limitless influence, they don't have tanks, uh, but they, they're in a very good position to exert influence on who is chosen by the people. They may but be it, very popular, by the way. It's not impossible. The Italians really, a lot of them, really hated Silvio Berlusconi. And, and yet, all of those people who said you can't have a single currency without a single... <laughs> Um, economy, and you can't have a single economy effectively without a super state in Bale, able to impose its will um, on all of these ex democracies um, around. Those people are being proved right, aren't they? Well, it's always been my view, um, going back 25 years when this debate started, I'm old enough to have been involved in it that long, that uh, the, the European currency would require some sort of federal state, maybe a federal state, maybe the Swiss model. It doesn't need to be that strong. But the, 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 if this was to work, and that was a very big question, it couldn't function as it was created. And I think we're now getting to the point where that's become pretty well obvious to everybody, and it's because they can't agree on a way forward that will work politically that, and on the other hand they can see no way of going back. I mean, getting out of this without a tremendous mess is terrifying. They're, they're in this horrendous crisis. Simon Heffer, do you simply sit there and say we told you so or do you think that actually balancing as it were a lesser a less satisfactory form of democracy with an economic bloc is now the only way forward? Well, I know you're very well read in politics, Andrew, and you may not realise it, but you were quoting a couple of minutes ago when you were talking about a, a single super state and a single policy and a single currency. Um, you were quoting almost exactly a speech that Enoch Powell made in 1969 um, in arguing why we should not enter what was then called the common market uh, because of the ambitions to have this single currency. I mean, what he in fact said at the end was there'll have to be a single Chancellor of the Exchequer and it won't be ours. Now, what I can't really understand is how countries that have been so used to democracy and have regarded democracy as a great virtue are now, despite the economic crisis, or obviously because of the economic crisis, turning around and saying, well, actually, we can put democracy in abeyance. What I'm waiting to see is how successful Mr Papandemos in Greece and how successful Mr Monti in Italy <laughs> are at getting their electorates to do what they would like them to do. Mm. I don't know what's going to happen if, at some stage in the next two or three months, the electorates of Italy and of Greece, whether formally asked at the ballot box or forced, as they see it, to go onto the streets and protest, make it quite clear that they don't like what the technocrats are asking them to do. Mm. And I don't see how there can be a reconciliation between... Um, a Europe that has a single currency and therefore requires some degree of fiscal union and what individual people want. And this, is, this has been one of the great problems of the whole European project. I remember 20 years ago talking to Kenneth Clark about this and saying, look, Ken, what is left to people who are used to democracy when they're faced with an economic policy that they don't like and it goes wrong and voting changes nothing? Absolutely. And he simply said to me, I think this was 1992, it was about the time that we were booted out of ERM, the currency wouldn't ever be so weak that there'd be that sort of economic problem. Now, of course, now we know that is wrong. I'm not saying I told you so, but even to someone with just an A-level in economics like me, it seemed to be quite clear from the start that if you wanted to have a single currency, you had to have a single economic policy and a single chancellor. And that was going to be a problem. Um, Maha, I'm, I'm just more interested in to what extent, if at all, these problems are being observed and thought about um, in countries like Egypt and in the Arab world, because, you know, if it was simply television images, you could take Tahir Square, and it's not so dissimilar what we've seen in the centre of Athens, not yet in the Piazza Navona in Rome, but, you know, you can... You, you, you can run ahead and see and see the same kind of revolt going, up, going well, I, on. I think at a certain level there is that connectivity among the bloggers, among the protesters, the Western at least educated protesters in Tahrir Square. Uh, they're following what's happening in, in Wall Street, they were following what's happening in Greece, and they feel that this is some kind, especially among the liberal and left uh, wing of them, that this is some kind of uh, world revolution against capitalism. It's to that extent, and it's expressed as such in their tweets and in the, on their blogs and so on. And I think uh, it's something that was just said a minute ago that, you know, for, for, for a generation of young in Europe, it's not the democracy in a sense, and, and it's a good term, um, you know, is in the abyss. On the contrary, they, what they're saying this is a new kind of democracy. It's people's democracy. And they're separating that from the capitalist system and they're hoping that somehow that that kind of disparity in wealth can be corrected and that is somehow the same uh, expression of anger at uh, you know that capitalism mm. has not delivered 
in the Arab world. And it, it, there is a connection there between the young in Greece and the young in Egypt. And yet, as we've argued on this programme before, discussed on this programme before, this is an inchoate, programless, um, philosophy-less um, opposition. You know, it's a long, long way from the old days of the sort of left who had their alternative economic strategy and their plans and their this, whether that would have been disastrous or not. At least there was a, you know, there was a plan, there was an alternative there. The protests, um, you know, around uh, around the world at the moment are much, much vaguer. Their expressions, their, their bellowings of anger rather than a programmatic they, they, challenge. They, they actually um, support the fact, a lot of the people who are protesting, that these are organic, they are leaderless. But the problem is that with that is when you come to election time, as you do in Egypt, they're not organised enough then to counter the people they don't like, such as the Muslim Brotherhood. Who do have a plan. Who, who do, do have, have a, a plan program. and have yes. leaders. Yes. George? Well, you know, this is... Um, uh, one of the reasons why we have to uh, sort of... Uh, Exercise caution, you know, when we move into uh, uh, elections. Okay, we, we have, you know, after you remove the dictatorship, okay, uh, there has to be some uh, it, 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 the, the the transition to elections has to be well planned and well thought out. Otherwise, the revolution can be hijacked. Uh, reason why I'm saying this, I mean, if you if you look at, I'm not saying that you know, you look at the U.S. for example. By the time the U.S. gained its independence in 1776, and by the time it moved to full constitutional rule, it was 13 years after. Uh, by the time South Africa, you know, uh, released Mandela, had you know, elections was three years. Okay, the danger that Egypt and Tunisia face is that they're moving too quickly uh, to elections, and when you move too quickly to elections. Then you give an advantage to those parties who are, who are already entrenched. But that's like, a problem because th if you don't move too quickly, you end up with the army running things for even longer. Well, then you see the thing is, you know, you would like to have free and fair elections. You have to clean up the electoral commission. You want to have the rule of law. You have to clean up the judiciary. You want to have the uh, professional and neutral security forces. Then you have to clean up the uh, military, and that's why it's important that you have institutional reform. Now, if you look at Tunisia, for example, I consider the uh, revolution there to be hijacked uh, by the old, uh, another, you know, uh, party. The youth have completely been left out of it. And, 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 and if you move too quickly in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood is going to hijack this thing. And this is why, you know, uh -huh. you, ha you have to know. have some sufficient time for the new parties to, add, you know, <clears throat> to be formed and also for the new parties to be campaigning. I, like I think we've got to be careful about the Muslim Brotherhood <clears throat> because it's a very uh, broad-based party. It is made up of a younger generation. Something that's often forgotten when we talk about the Facebook generation that were at the forefront of these revolutions is that the Facebook generation is also made up of Islamists, a young generation of Islamists that want to promote their version of of Islam, which is open, liberal, more forward thinking, and so on. So, yes, the, we've moved to elections fairly quickly. I don't think they could have been delayed any longer in the Arab world. Once you've removed a dictator, you've got to move towards free and fair elections. Because mm -hmm. Egypt is also not Tahrir, as we've heard on the media. It, the, the, the vast majority of Egyptians are anxious and waiting for the economy to revive and they want these elections to happen and they want stability and security. They don't feel the protesters in Tahrir are necessarily going to give them that. Simon Heffer, then Martin Wolf. What I'm not clear about in Egypt, and I defer completely to your expertise on this, is how far the, uh, the Islamists there are religious and how far they're ideological. And that, to me, seems to have been the great change that we've seen in, in Islam in, in my lifetime, that what began simply as religious doctrine, has now become a political ideology. I think the Muslim Brotherhood have to be treated as a political party that has an ideology that is, is essentially one that wants to move towards civilian government. I mean, the idea that they are in somehow in cahoots with the military, they've played a political game, but they are committed to a civilian government and they have an Islamic colouring. There are those parties there that are more extreme and have a stronger Islamic orientation, but ultimately, yes, we're dealing with political parties that have an ideological uh, uh, mm. taint to them. Are uh, therefore much more ruthless? Uh, not necessarily much more ruthless if they're willing to play the, the democratic game, which it seems for now they, they are. For now. Yeah. Yeah. Martin Wolf. It occurs to me that the depressing thing about this story, we're talking about the, the, trying to develop democracy successfully in countries that have 
been under dictatorship for a long time. Of course, the depressing thing about the European story, apart from this interplay between the centre and the member states, is, of course, Italy and Greece, to, Italy a very important country, got into this situation of, as it were, needing a technocrat because the democratic process in this very important country failed. Have it we? didn't deal with problems that everybody knew were there uh, and had to be dealt with. And, and Greece is an even more egregious example. I mean, the democratic governments in the, 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 in the 2000s, after they joined the currency union, behaved just grotesquely irresponsibly. But how, so how? democracy fails, alas. And then we have to start again. That is sad. Yeah. And perhaps we have just been too glib and too smug about incorporating all, quotes democratic countries on the same level inside the same tent. I mean, Berlusconi's Italy was ruled by somebody who also had control of the the television stations. And uh, and indeed, Greece had ruled by the colonels for a long time. I mean, these countries are not the same in their political history as Britain, never mind France um, or the Netherlands. Stable democracy is difficult. There's, Final thought there, there's another glaring example of this. I thought the G8 was meant to be a collection of, of Western democracies, and we invite Russia to G8 meetings. Russia has proved it's neither Western nor democratic. Absolutely right. And on that um, firm and crisp um, opinion, we have run out of time. So thank you to all my guests. Maha Azam from Chatham House, who will no doubt be following the events in Egypt closely during the rest of today and tomorrow. Thank you for coming in. Maha, Martin Wolf from the Financial Times. His recent series for BBC Radio for a new global economics is still available online. Details on the Start the Week website. Simon Heffer's essay, A Short History on Power, is available in all good bookshops now. And George Ayetes, Defeating Dictatorships, is as well. Next week, we have philosophical debates. We have France's perhaps classic public intellectual or philosopher Bernard-Henri Lévy and somebody who could hardly be more different, Roger Scruton, who isn't, certainly isn't a French intellectual but is a philosopher. Sparks will fly, I hope. Join me then if you can, but for now, goodbye.